Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Solam. Uh, thanks for inviting me to give this talk. I rest assured this wasn't my idea. This was an idea actually uh, of somebody who wasn't here, Jason Su, uh, actually mooted the idea that um, you know people are saying all sorts of things on social media about the courts, the judges, and so on. And maybe it's good to have some sort of uh, a slightly more academic uh, understanding of what is really going on in the courts so that we can at least uh, you know, uh, speak with some uh, knowledge and, and, and temperance in a certain sense. So maybe uh, I will begin with, I, I won't go into all the sort of nuts and bolts of the details about the judiciary, but uh, maybe begin by looking at some of these criticisms that have been leveled against Singapore's judiciary. You know, when you look at uh, 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 overseas, assessments about the Singapore judiciary, you will come to see rather contradictory uh, uh, assessments. And on the one hand, if you look at these sort of competitive indexes and so on and so forth, you will find that Singapore rates extremely high, very often number one, number two, uh, as the best legal systems in the world because it's very efficient, it's, uh, it's not corrupt, uh, you get your cases heard in a very, very quick time. Uh, you know, and the lawyers in the room, and I've quite a number of you here, I know, uh, will testify to that. In fact, it, it's, it's sometimes uh, quite a, a, a challenge for lawyers because uh, once you file a case, you may have very little time to prepare before you need to go into court for an appearance. Uh, this is to be contrasted with some other judicial systems, for example. I mean, if you file a case, um, especially if it is a, a private law case, a land law case in India, for example, uh, you, you might need uh, you, you, you might need to go to court maybe in about 16 years so uh, so th th this is the kind of efficiency that uh, has garnered us very very high ratings on the other hand you would see some kinds of uh, rating indices uh, uh, give Singapore very low uh, ratings um, I only plucked out one because uh, this was easily available uh, uh, by Freedom House right they do one uh, rating on all sorts of things from civil liberties and so on and one section, the section F is on rule of law uh, Singapore scored 7 upon 16, so fail um, and <clears throat> the criteria is this, right? So uh, four points for this question is there an independent judiciary, okay? So the question then, uh, and the response is uh, I, I, I quote from the Freedom House 2018 report the government's consistent success in court cases that have direct implications for its agenda has cast serious doubt on judicial independence. The problem is particularly evident in defamation cases and lawsuits against government opponents. However, the judiciary is perceived to act more professionally and impartially in business-related cases, which has helped to make the country an attractive venue for investment and commerce. So you see in this one short paragraph, exactly these two sentiments being echoed. Okay, when it comes to you know, anything involving the government, comes to civil rights, liberties and so on, ah, uh, fail. Okay, but if it comes to, and, and by the way, the score was one upon four, so again, fail. All right, um, uh, now let us try and unpack what people are saying. Yeah? Uh, when you say, okay, your ju judiciary is not independent, what are the reasons given? So I'm just going to take a number of things that I've summarised from various, I I'm not going to give you all the various sources, but if you look at all the critiques that have been given, various reports, uh, law, uh, uh, whether they be from Amnesty International or they come from uh, you know, uh, 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 jurist commissions and what have you, uh, you can summarise uh, the criticisms, I think, in these sort of four categories. Uh, one, all right, so, so in other words, complete the sentence, the Singapore judiciary is not independent because, number one, it says, the, gov the judiciary is pro-government, the government always wins. Um, that's one criticism. Number two, the judiciary is influenced by the executive. It seems to suggest that there is some pressure, there's some way in which pressure may be exerted on the judiciary. Number three, judges allow the courts to be used for political purposes, such as bankrupting opposition politicians, uh, especially in defamation suits. And defamation suits keep, keeps coming up all the time. And I will talk about the defamation suits in a moment. Uh, then, finally, the government always wins defamation cases. Ah, sorry, so, so three and four, yeah, right? Defamation cases, the government always wins. Um, 
I think, first of all, this argument, uh, I think we've got to get rid of this first argument, which is that the government always wins, therefore the courts are not independent. Well, if, as Gary Lineker says, football is defined as a game with 22 men chasing a ball, and at the end of the day, Germany wins. This, this time they didn't. Huh? Uh, if one team keeps winning, does it mean that the whole thing is a kelong? I think that is uh, a bit of an insult to one's intelligence. No. I mean, you have to ask yourself, right? First of all, uh, when uh, you have a suit, right? Whether or not they should win or not win. I think the question must be whether they won correctly or not. Right? If, if they should not have won and they won, then you say, aha, hmm, something funny going on there. Now, let me just tell you something about lawyers. Uh, and there are enough lawyers in here who I think will verify this. If lawyers had a choice, they would not go to court to lose. I think so, right? I mean, what, what would you... Okay, if I'm advising a client and my client gives me a really lousy case, and I say, wow, this one, uh, I think we're going we're gonna to lose. What do you tell your client? You probably say, hey, I think uh, if we can settle, we'll settle the case. Uh, of course, there are different reasons why people might want to go, despite the fact that they will lose. Sometimes just to make a statement, sometimes just to give hell to the other side, you know. Uh, there are a whole host of these kinds of reasons. But if one were totally rational in an economic sense, you say, well, hang on, I'm not going to go in there, lose, and then pay costs and all that. I'd rather cut my losses, let's do a settlement, and then we, 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 we don't fight this case. So if you say that <laughs> the, the, every time the government goes in on defamation cases and they win, then I think you have to ask the question, should they have won or should they not have won rather than, oh, because they always win, therefore the judiciary, there's, there's a problem with the judiciary. Okay, I, I think this is where, uh, and I will, I will give you a, a brief analysis of some of these cases uh, later on. But before we go into particularities, let me deal with what the law is on judicial independence, right? What is it that guarantees judicial independence in Singapore? And here uh, I have to give you some rather wordy extracts from the composition, uh, from, from the constitution. Right? Article 94, one talks about the composition of the court uh, and 95.3 says that the office of the judge of the Supreme Court shall not be abolished during his continuance in office. Now this is one safeguard. In other words, you can't abolish the office and therefore make the, job, uh, make the judge jobless. Right? Th that's a threat, that's something you could do. Um, and in political theory, uh, and legal theory, of course, uh, you guarantee uh, independence of judges in two ways. One is by what we call security of tenure. In other words, uh, you, you, you know how long you're going to be in office and they can't touch you except for just cause. And security of remuneration. In other words, they can't, they can't cut your pay, neither can they abolish your office. So these are the two main devices that are used universally. Now, not every country employs what we call a tenure system. So in Singapore, uh, we follow the British system whereby once you're appointed to the bench, uh, you serve continuously uh, on good behaviour until uh, the age of 65. Singapore, the age of retirement, 65. There are a few jurisdictions in the world, such as the United States, that have life tenure. So you, you, you can die uh, while in office, right? Uh, recently, of course, I'm, I'm quite sure you have been watching the news, uh, Clint, uh, uh, Trump has been making a new nomination to replace uh, uh, Judge Kennedy who has retired right, or resigned from the court, but um, they basically can go on till the end. Right? Uh, some other countries, especially what we call civil law jurisdictions, countries that use the civil code, uh, countries like uh, Korea, uh, Taiwan for example, they don't use the tenure system, they use what we call fixed terms. So if I appoint you, you are on the bench for usually a term of between six and seven years, and usually two terms. So one term, six years, reappointed second term, six years, and that's it. You, you cannot serve any further. So the advantage of these fixed terms is that, well, no one can disturb you during the time that you are on the bench, and uh, there is no incentive for you 
to curry favour with anybody because hey, at the end of the six years, that's it. I mean, you know, no matter how, how good you look, you're only going to get six years or six more years and, and that's all there will be. So these are the two main techniques that have been used around the world to secure uh, uh, independence for the judges. So we have this in Article 95, you can't abolish the office. Uh, who can qualify to be a judge? Well, any person who has an aggregate period of not less than 10 years as a qualified person. So a qualified person, I won't go into this, it's very complicated. Uh, there's a whole long list. But basically, if you graduate from an approved law school like NUS, SMU, you are a qualified person. And then after 10 years, uh, you can qualify to sit on the bench. That doesn't mean you should go on the bench, but you do qualify. Um, how are judges appointed? They are appointed by the president, right? acting in his discretion on the advice of the prime minister, provided that he concurs. You see, so here the elected president has a slight discretion. He must concur with the recommendation of the prime minister. Okay? This is nothing new. All prime ministers in the world, I mean, in, in this kinds of system, it's usually an executive who will make an appointment. Uh, United States is a very uh, interesting mix whereby they have executive nomination but legislative confer uh, confirmation. So the Senate in the United States must now uh, confirm uh, uh, Trump's uh, nominee. Right? We have no such thing. In most Commonwealth countries, it usually just goes straight from the uh, Prime Minister, the uh, head executive, uh, to the head of state and then we get appointed. Um, now, before the Prime Minister tenders his advice to the President, he must, in all cases, save for the appointment of the Chief Justice, consult the Chief Justice, right? Uh, it does not say that the Chief just he must concur with the Chief Justice's view, but of course, uh, when you confer with the Chief Justice, presumably you will take on board what the Chief Justice has to say. Uh, I do not know yet how this uh, conferment takes place, uh, exactly what takes place, what Prime Minister asks. Um, but uh, from what I do know, quite often, the Chief Justice has uh, a list already. Okay? And I will talk about the appointments process in a while. Well, I might as well talk about it now. In Singapore, we don't have an independent body for the appointment of judges or for the proposal of nominations for judges. Uh, we have bucked the trend. Uh, the trend these days uh, in many countries around the world is to have an independent judicial appointments commission. Now, what does the judicial appointments commission do? It generally becomes something like the PSC, the Public Service Commission, but for judges. And so, uh, if you want to be a judge, you must apply for the job. Okay? Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, your entire record will be there for the public uh, to scrutinise. And, uh, of course, uh, that, that creates a certain level of transparency because uh, if a very good candidate, at least on paper, does not get nominated, then people will be asking, hey, you know, what happened to this chap, right? Uh, right now, we have adopted the old English. The English have changed the law. They, they have uh, reformed the law since 2006. Uh, they now have a Judicial Appointments Commission, very controversial at first, because all these old lawyers thought, oh, come on, you know, how can I apply for a job, right? I must. Uh, we inherited what we call the tap on the shoulder method. Right, what's the tap on the shoulder? Well, you're walking along the corridor and say, hey, would you like to have tea? You know, and, then, uh, and then, of course, you know, would you consider, you know, I'm not quite sure it's tea all the time, but, uh, but generally, they will be asked if they would like to consider an appointment on the bench. So, how does this sort of talent scouting uh, 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 go? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a big mystery. Right? I mean, if you ask uh, different judges, how did you, uh, you know, who introduced you? Well, actually, I don't know. Somebody gave my name to the chief. Uh, or, you know, so there are, you know, the, the, I suppose the, the, peop the, 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 the courts have got their tentacles out there. And of course, uh, our profession, our judiciary draws large, a lot uh, of members from the profession. So you kind of know who are the good lawyers and who might make a, possibly a good judge and so on and so forth. All right? Uh, 
Now, of course, the tap on the shoulder uh, 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 methodology is totally non-transparent because uh, you, you can offer your shoulder, but they may never be tapped, right? So, uh, uh, and, and, and then you can't say, hey, hey, tap, tap, I want to be a judge. Right? You, can't, you can't do that, right? So, uh, so you, the, the whole idea of having an independent judicial uh, 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 what do you call it? Um, uh, appointments commission uh, is actually a very good one in terms of transparency. So, you would apply. In fact, uh, in England, in the first few years, uh, it, it went through a bit of a rough patch because many of the silks, the barristers, the uh, Queen's Council, they felt an insult. How can I apply for a job? If you think I'm good enough, you must tap my shoulder. How can you, how can you make me apply for a job? Right? But eventually, eventually, and, and actually this was, this was very good in breaking that stranglehold which the old public school uh, mafia had in the UK. It tended always to be, you know, sort of, Eton, Winchester, Oxbridge, that, that sort of people. But then you began to see with applications, very, very good uh, people coming from what you call the red brick universities and so on and so forth. So it actually widened the scope of who uh, could become judges. But nonetheless, there, 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 there is nothing in the appointment process here that guarantees you that the person whom you have appointed will always uh, abide by uh, your politics. Right? The whole idea of independence is that once you're on the bench, you, you never know what's going to happen. And this has happened so many times, especially if you look at a very politicized bench like the United States. Uh, a a rep Republican president might think this person might be a good conservative judge and then when he or she goes on the bench, then they flip around and they're like, oh my God, I appointed the wrong guy. Right? Um, but that's the whole purpose of independence. Once you're there, then you, you should be able to act according to your own conscience. Okay, more, more uh, provisions. Um, we have a provision here which is rather problematic, and that is the Judicial Commissioner. The Judicial Commissioner was a position that was created in 1979. The main reason for its creation was that uh, we were unable to attract many judges uh, or many practitioners to become judges. Now, just by way of history, by the 1970s, the problem of the shortage of judges in our High Court was getting very, very acute. Believe it or not, there were less than seven judges at that point in time. At one time, it dropped down to five judges. Okay, so that's, that's going to be a big problem because obviously they aren't going to be able to cope with the caseload and many of them were getting quite old. The main reason for this was very simple. There was a huge disparity between the income that was made by judges and uh, those in private practice, right? So, uh, and, and I'm, let me give you some uh, historical figures. In 1986, um, I know because I checked this up, in 1986, uh, the Chief Justice was making $18,600 a month. Uh, even by today's standards, quite good, I, I, you know. I don't mind getting $18,000, $600 a month. But, 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 but let, let's just contextualize this. Uh, the Chief Justice's peers, persons who were about roughly his seniority in private practice, would have been heads of law firms, they would be getting anything from two to three million a year. So if you just sort of do the sums, okay, one million a year, lah, huh? one million divided by 12, it's still way, way more than what the Chief Justice was making. So, uh, this was a big problem uh, because of salaries. So, uh, the government was a bit slow to move the salaries. They began to move all the salaries only in the 1990s, along with the ministerial salaries. Huh? But before that, there was this big disparity. So, you couldn't uh, attract uh, top practitioners uh, to become judges. Um, then, they thought of a scheme called the Judicial Commissioner Scheme. Must be someone who had done NS. Uh, because they thought, well, you know, why don't we create a scheme whereby an appointment could be made for one to three years, we get a top practitioner in, persuade them that they should do some national service, <laughs> all right? And then later on, you know, when they've done their two, three years, help to clear the backlog, you, you can go back into practice. Well, whoever thought of this scheme obviously had not been in legal practice before because you think your clients are going to be sitting around waiting two, three years for you to come back? I mean, by the time you come back, your clients have all dissipated and gone elsewhere already, right? They can't be waiting for you. Um, so, 
didn't work very well. In fact, in 1979, the uh, constitution was amended. The first appointment came only in 1986. And uh, that was Chan Sek-kyung, who became the first judicial commissioner and then later on became chief justice. Right? So, I mean, not immediately, but, you know, uh, well, actually it took him 20 years before he became chief justice. Um, so, uh, so, you could not uh, uh, get good practitioners uh, into service. Uh, in fact, I had asked Chan Tae Kyung why he agreed in seven in eighty six uh, to to uh, accept the appointment, and he said actually they had been asking me for years, and I kept saying no, you know. And I then I said then why did you say yes? He said well you know, in Singapore you know right, uh, if somebody asks you you can say no only three times, <laughs> then you must say yes, right? That 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 person of course is Lee Kuan Yew, right? So if Lee Kuan Yew asks you, you can say no one time, two times. After the third time, you've got to say something. So he said, no, no, no. Uh, I don't want to be a judge. I just want to be a judicial commissioner. Because obviously, uh, he had uh, 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 plans to return to practice. Right? So he said, look, I'll take the appointment. I'll do two years. I will really serve my, my country, my national service. And then I want to go back to practice after that. But of course, um, uh, that was a time when there was tremendous change. And then uh, he was persuaded to stay on and then became attorney general and so on. So he remained, right? But you can't guarantee that everybody would do that. There were other legal practitioners, top pr practitioners like Joseph Grimberg, uh, Michael Huang. Uh, they went in for a year and then they went back into practice, right? One year was about as much as you could get away from your practice without losing all your clients, I think. Um, so, anyhow, um, this scheme has been in our statute books, in our constitution since 1979. And this is a, an aberration of the security of tenure uh, proposition, right? Because obviously, if I'm going to appoint you only for a year, two years, three years, uh, you may, it's possible, I'm not saying that anybody has done this, but it is possible that you want to endear yourself such that you may be asked to stay on. Right? So, of course, what happens with the judicial commissioners is you come in and today it is seen more like, like a probation. So, you're always appointed as a judicial commissioner and then after, well, depending on how good you are, but usually six months or a year, sometimes a year and a half, you become elevated to a full judge. Um, so, you know, this is one question mark, right? Should we continue to have judicial commissioners because obviously... Um, the time when they did the amendment in 79 and today, the situation is very, very different. Today, our judges are the highest paid in the world, right? Granted, they don't make as much as their friends in private practice. But uh, the starting pay for a judicial commissioner is about $900,000 a year. That's not bad. And then, of course, you go up uh, as, as a full judge, it goes over a million and then CJ comes close to, about, I think, about 3 million. So, so you, it's very, very comparable. I mean, you would be very comfortable uh, sitting uh, on, on the bench. Um, and so maybe it's time that this, this should be uh, uh, abolished, right? Um, so in any case, these are just the provisions which show you what the judicial commissioner uh, may do. Maybe uh, uh, now... One of the biggest problems is Article 95.5. Let me just read in case you can't see it back. A judicial commissioner may be appointed to hear and determine a specific case only or be appointed for a specified period. Now, specified periods, no problem. That's usually one year, two years. I mean, that one we know. But can you imagine that if the... Prime Minister can recommend to the President to appoint a Judicial Commissioner for a single case. I can cherry pick, isn't it? I can pick somebody totally not within legal service, somebody I like. And I said, let's appoint this guy as the Judicial Commissioner to handle this particular case. This goes completely against the judicial power of the court. All right? This is clearly... Uh, uh, an infringement of the, the, the court's judicial power. So I've always argued this. My ex-students among them know I've always said this. This is a big problem because uh, 
once a case goes to the court, it should be no business of the executive to decide how that case is going to be heard, much less selecting a judge. By the way, even though this has been in the constitution since 1992 or 93, uh, it has never been used. So it has never been challenged. Nobody's actually said, well, you can't sit as judicial commissioner because you were appointed under 95.5 and therefore I am going to challenge this. So far, it has never happened. Okay? But this is one of the big problems. Um, the second problem is on retirement age. All right? uh, the age of retirement of the judge is 65 years uh, plus 6 months. In case you're wondering why this plus 6 months uh, adds in, it's purely practical. Uh, it's very common in most countries uh, because you don't want the judge, you know, to hit his 65th birthday while he's part hearing a case and he says, okay, bye-bye tomorrow. And then, and then the case gets part heard, right? I mean, no, so you, 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 you give another six months to finish off unfinished business, right? I mean, you never know uh, uh, how long a trial might last. Sometimes a trial looks like it might take three days and it goes for three weeks. I mean, it all depends, right? So that's purely practical. The problem here, of course, is that um, we have also, since the 1970s, had a provision in the Constitution that provides for what we call supernumerary judges, contract judges. Beyond the age of 65, if you uh, uh, are still, you know, uh, uh, compost mentis and you are still able to act, uh, you may be appointed uh, for a specified period. Again, this was instituted because you didn't have enough judges, right? In fact, the first judge who got an extension was um, uh, Murray Butros, who was actually Australian, right? He was one of the last colonial judges and they wanted to have him there because very experienced, uh, very efficient um, and no sense retiring him because uh, you didn't have enough judges to fill the place anyway. So again, this is one of these provisions where uh, I think it's a big problem, right? What's the point of saying that you're, you have tenure till 65 and then say, well, I can, I can let you have another two years, another three years. Uh, that is a problem because for that couple of years, you don't really have independence or security of tenure. Not only that, what if you're given one year and you want to incentivize the government to give you yet another year? Right? So this, this, you, you don't want to put yourself in that kind of position. Again, I do not say that anybody has ever done this. All I'm saying is that you can do this. Uh, and the, uh, as far as lawyers are concerned, uh, the, the, the possibilities all right, uh, already make this uh, a, a, a problem. Okay? Now, so one of the big problems here is that you can have uh, judges who are beyond the age of 65. So, in fact, these were the uh, previous three chief justices, other than the present one. Every single one of them was be above the age of 65 when they were chief justice. Wee Chong Jin, of course, served a very, very long time. So he was not yet 65 when he became chief justice, but eventually, uh, you know, had to retire, uh, ret uh, retired when he was in his 70s. Right? Yong Bang Hao went on till, I think, age 81, right? Uh, Chan Seng Kiong retired at the age of 76, right, as Chief Justice. So, all the Chief Justices prior, other than the current Sundaresh Menon, who is still way under 65, uh, they all served uh, as Chief Justices above the age of 65. And at one point, our Court of Appeal, our highest court in Singapore, had two judges above the age of 65. Two out of three, right? So, you could argue that, hey, you know, if you uh, allow for these uh, contract judges, right? They may be, they may be incentivized uh, to, uh, to stay on or to decide things one way or the other. You could say, well, you know, the, uh, the appointment process uh, might be that particular incentive. Okay? Um, right, so these are your various provisions. Uh, how do you remove judges? Well, uh, judges are not easy to remove. Um, Basically, uh, the grounds for removal are if the Prime Minister or Chief Justice uh, represents to the President that the judge of the Supreme Court or Judicial Commissioner uh, uh, has misbehaved or is uh, 
unable from infirmity of body or mind or any other cause, uh, unable to discharge the function of office, there shall be appointed a tribunal uh, to decide on whether a judge should be relieved of his or her position. Okay? We have never had any judges in our uh, modern history removed uh, from, from the courts uh, whatsoever. Uh, there was no need to, thankfully. Uh, uh, the only time we've seen something close to that was when Mahathir uh, removed the judges in Malaysia in 1988. Now he's back. Uh, but he's, he's, he's actually appointed the first non-Malay chief justice in Malaysia, Richard Malanjum, right? Uh, Non-Malay, non-Muslim uh, chief justice, highest judicial officer uh, in the land. Very, very interesting uh, developments in Malaysia. So, uh, so misbehaviour, well, uh, that could be anything. Presumably, if you committed a heinous crime, uh, that would be misbehavior. Uh, uh, but beyond that, right, there's, there's quite great latitude. We don't have enough precedents to, to, to go on what qualifies as misbehavior. Um, the, the, the tribunal to remove the judges shall be no less than five persons who have held the office of a judge of the Supreme Court uh, or an equivalent in uh, any part of the Commonwealth. This is in... Uh, keeping with the idea that judges should not be removed except by their own peers. In other words, uh, only judges can judge judges, right? Uh, professionals. Um, and um, uh, judges can also be suspended pending uh, a hearing, right? So these are these the constitutional provisions. Uh, that uh, protect the independence of the judges. So as far as Singapore is concerned, let me recap. Uh, we, out of the two main things, security of tenure, security of remuneration, uh, we have definitely security of remuneration, not only security of remuneration, but very good remuneration. Um, and you've got security of tenure up to a point with two exceptions, contract judges and judicial commissioners. Right? So these, these are the slight problems. Now, let me deal now with the what is sayable, unsayable, this, this, this big story, right? Which is about contempt of court. There are two types of contempt of court, generally speaking. One is what we call contempt by interference. In other words, you interfere with the process of justice, right? Either you disrupt the court process, so you start kicking a fuss and yelling at people in the courtroom, you know, that, that's contempt of court. Uh, but you can also be held uh, guilty of contempt of court by sub -judice. This is something which uh, very often people are not very clear about. Uh, that is commenting on a case with the view of affecting its outcome. Okay? It's quite different. I can comment on the case. I can, if you ask me about a particular case which is still pending, I say, oh, I think the judge got it wrong. That, that, that in itself is not wrong. It's okay. That's my opinion. But if I start writing an op-ed and I, I kind of push the court in a particular direction, I may be cited for contempt. Right? This is the sub judice rule. Um, scandalizing the judiciary, this is something that uh, we will talk about in greater detail. Right? What amounts to scandalizing the judiciary? The idea that you are imputing uh, some form of bias, dishonesty, or lack of independence in the court. That's called scandalizing the judiciary. Then, of course, the second type of contempt, contempt is the contempt by disobedience. This is quite standard. If a court gives you an order and you fail to uh, uh, follow the order, then you might be cited for contempt. There are a lot of uh, these types of cases in the courts, uh, you know, particularly with things like alimony payments. The court orders you to pay alimony, then you don't pay, then pay, don't pay for three months, then you end up getting cited for contempt. Right? And by the way, uh, the court can jail you for contempt. So, uh, there's a great incentive to obey uh, the court's uh, instructions. Now, as far as um, scandalizing the judiciary is concerned, right? Uh, the case law on it uh, developed in this particular way. Now we have a statute, but I thought I'd give you a little bit about the case law. Um, we more or less uh, we take the position of what contempt is about, uh, at least the rationale for it, uh, from an uh, English case called the Attorney General and Times newspaper. And there, uh, the court said, the law house of law said, the law of contempt is founded entirely on public policy. 
It is not there to protect the private rights of the parties to the litigation or the prosecution. It is there to prevent interference with the administration of justice and it should be limited to what is reasonably necessary for that purpose. So therefore, again, the whole objective of citing somebody for contempt is not to say, oh, I want to protect the judge's reputation or anything like that. I want to ensure that you do not subvert the cause of justice. Right? Uh, so that's the rationale. This was repeated in a house uh, in the High Court decision in uh, Daniel Hertzberg's case. Uh, it says here again, the rationale for law of contempt is rooted firmly in the public interest. It aims to protect the administration of justice as well as public confidence in it, which is crucial for the rule of law and the maintenance of law and order in any civilized society. It is not in any way intended to protect the dignity of the courts or the judges. So uh, again, this is the logic. All right, what, has, uh, what can the courts do? The State's Courts Act, as well as the Supreme Court of Judicature Act, both have provisions that allow the court to punish for contempt. Okay? Um, how do you proceed? You proceed by way of a committal uh, initiated by the uh, Attorney General. So usually, uh, there would be a complaint that's made to the Attorney General. The Attorney General will investigate the case and then bring the, uh, the accused uh, before the court. Now, between 1991 and 2011, Singapore took an extremely conservative view about what constitutes contempt. Very, very conservative. It was known as the inherent tendency test. Right? And the test uh, basically uh, was articulated first in the case of Barry Wayne's case uh, against the Attorney General. This was the Asian Wall Street Journal, which suggested that the Singapore judiciary was biased in a case between Lee Kuan Yew and the Far Eastern Economic Review. Okay. Um, now, uh, in that case, basically what they said was, it is settled law that any publication which alleges bias, lack of impartiality, impropriety or any wrongdoing concerning a judge in the exercise of his judicial function, which has terminated, is contempt of court. It is sufficient to prove that the words complained of have an inherent tendency to interfere with the administration of justice. Now, uh, what does that mean? Uh, you, you don't... Okay, what we, it's very difficult for us to understand what it really means, but I can tell you what it does not mean. It does not mean that it has actually got to cause people to think that the court was biased. Okay, So long as there's a tendency, right? that people would think that way, that would be sufficient. Now, the problem with tendencies is that you can't prove it. You can never prove tendencies, right? Uh, and uh, in fact, this was acknowledged by Justice De Yong Kuang in uh, the Daniel Hilksburg case. He said, well, you know, we, we kind of like the inherent tendency test because it has two clear advantages, right? First, it does not call for detailed proof of what in many instances will be unprovable. Namely, that the public confidence in the administration of justice really was impaired by relevant publication. Secondly, it enables the court to step in before the damage, i.e. the impairment of public confidence in the administration of justice actually occurs. So it is both uh, great because we don't have to prove anything. And secondly, uh, it's prophylactic. We can step in. It's a... It's, it's a a, 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 a preemptive strike. We, we move in before people uh, worry about you know, the, the confidence in their judiciary already. So this was a position that was adopted by the courts for good 20 years. Now, what happened in 2011? Well, uh, this was what happened. Uh, the case of uh, Alan Shadrick. Uh, this is Alan Shadrick. This is Ravi, his lawyer. Um, author of a book called Once a Jolly Hangman. And he was cited for contempt. I, I'm quite sure Alan Shadrick wanted to be cited for contempt. Uh, have you read the book? If you have read the book, you have the book on sale here? No? Yeah. no. Okay. But uh, anyway, if you read the book, you will know that he was egging the, the government on, right? Um, anyhow, uh, what changed in this case was that the court rejected 20 years of case law and said that, well, this inherent tendency test is no longer valid. It should now, it went all the way to the Court of Appeal. It said, we should now adopt the real likelihood test. 
right? So examples were given, such, such as if somebody was drunk and he started saying things like, oh, I think the Singapore judiciary is corrupt, and uh, uh, not likely people would believe an inebriated person. And therefore, you know, you can have an inherent tendency, but since I'm not likely to believe this person, there is no real likelihood that I'm going to be affected by what was uttered. Right? So uh, this was a test that was uh, much preferred. Right? Uh, so therefore, uh, the proper test to be applied now is the real risk test. The real risk test is adequate in and itself, so you don't need to explain what the real risk has to cannot be fanciful, cannot be too obscure. It must be a real risk, right? a reasonable real risk. Um, M. Ravi tried to push the American position. The American position uh, was what they call a clear and present danger test. In other words, uh, it's not enough for real likelihood. It must move to the level whereby you know, the entire confidence in the judiciary is about to be shaken to its foundations. Then you step in. Uh, and the court said, no, 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 that's an American test. Uh, has not been accepted anywhere else in the world, which is true. Uh, and therefore, we are not going we not gonna accept this. We will adopt the real likelihood test, right? Um, so therefore, the test now is, is there a real risk that the impugned statement has undermined or might undermine public confidence in the administration of justice in Singapore? And in making these decisions, we should always avoid extremes. In other words, you know, the nut cases on both sides, right? We, we, we take reasonable people, right? Um, now, this lasted, this wonderful period lasted five years because, um, oh yeah, sorry, uh, just to finish uh, up on, on, on uh, uh, is there a defense for uh, contempt of court? Well, uh, there is no fair criticism as a separate defence, although fair criticism can mitigate your, your culpability. And so the question then becomes, what is fair criticism of the court? Well, fair criticism of the court, uh, Justice Judith Prakash, in the case of John Tan Liang Ju, uh, this is the so-called uh, kangaroo t-shirt case. Uh, in case any of you remember, uh, three of them, uh, SDP members, went to court uh, wearing T-shirts with a kangaroo uh, and wearing judges' robes, right? Uh, and uh, did I have a picture of it? No, I don't have it. Uh, and uh, and um, and 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 this was Chi Sun Juan who was being sued, and then they they sort of called attention to their T-shirts, right? And one of them actually uh, shouted at Lee Kuan Yew and asked him to look at his T-shirt. Uh, anyway, uh, in in this particular trial. Uh, the question was uh, raised as to what is fair criticism. And uh, the courts have somehow adopted these principles. The first is that, is it made in good faith? Right? Secondly, is it supported by argument and evidence? Third, is it expressed in a temperate and dispassionate manner? And fourth, was there an improper motive? Okay. I think the first three are quite uh, easy to show, to demonstrate. Is it made in good faith? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm trying to criticise. Uh, that can be uh, looked at from what medium you use, how you did it, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, is it supported by argument and evidence? This is what uh, protects us academics, right? It's because we always criticise these cases and we always do it with uh, 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 some modicum of temperance uh, and, 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 and do it in a sort of dispassionate manner, right? We, we, we're, we're just dealing with the facts, dealing with the law, right? Rather than trying to raise, you know, sort of uh, uh, emotive uh, political arguments. The last one is a little bit harder. How do you figure out whether somebody's motive is improper or otherwise? I suppose that may be the sum total of how, how these first three have actually been executed, right? Now, I, I said that we had five years of the... Uh, the uh, uh, real risk test, and then Parliament intervened. Now, all this while, by the way, uh, it was very unusual that uh, the con all this while it was very unusual that um, contempt of court was the only crime that was not statutorily provided for in Singapore, right? And in fact, uh, 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 again. Uh, Chan Se-kyung, the former Chief Justice, when he was Attorney General, moved 
to try and change this, right? His argument was that it cannot be that the crime of what constitutes contempt is created by the court and then you are also prosecuted by the court in a sense through the Attorney General and then the court sits in judgment. This is a total breach of natural justice. So you have to put it on solid foundations. And therefore, uh, he drafted the first version of the Administration of Justice Protection Act. Um, I asked him later on whether he drafted Section 3. He said, yes, but not this Section 3. Um, this section, he followed, he followed the Court of Appeal decision in Alan Shadrick. In other words, the test for contempt was real likelihood. This is how it reads today. Any person who scandalizes the court by intentionally publishing any matter or doing any act that imputes improper motives or to or impugns the integrity, propriety or impartiality of any court and poses a risk that public confidence in the administration of justice would be undermined commits a contempt of court. Note the words which I've underlined. Poses a risk. It doesn't say poses a real risk. It doesn't say poses an inherent risk. It poses any risk. So, and this was questioned in Parliament. In fact, Law Minister Shamugam was asked, why have you not followed the Court of Appeal decision in Alan Shadrake? He says, no, 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 we're not having any of that. Okay? I do not want anyone to criticize our courts because the more you allow people to criticize the courts, the more you are denigrating a public institution and eventually the whole system will crumble. Okay? I, I'm paraphrasing it, of course. Um, um, and, and, and so he would not have it. He actually said, of course I know what the Court of Appeal has said. Of course, I know, know what the position is, but I'm not having any of this. I am making it any risk. Right? So this is the position as it stands today. Right? So this is the risk that you bear when you criticize the courts. Um, there, here you are. Right? This is uh, Shamugam. In these real words, okay? Um, if you allow constant attacks, attacks, say, of bias and corruption over time, the public perception of the judiciary will be affected. This, I think, is self-evident. If you allow baseless attacks on the judiciary, you get erosion of trust in the judiciary. The judiciary and the administration of justice are hugely precious assets for us. We inherited them from the UK and have made them better. And we must continue to protect it. Right? Members may say, yes, but why not the current layer of protection as in the common law, which is real risk. Then he tells you he knows the law. Um, I have explained why. I want to make sure that the integrity of the judiciary is pristine. I want to make sure that the integrity, uh, I, this will give us a strong anchoring in the rule of law, which in itself is of basic fundamental importance to our people. Secondly, quite importantly, it allows Singapore to be the preeminent, vibrant legal centre in the region. That is of tremendous value to Singapore. I don't know if this is a legal or economic argument. Um, but I, I notice the word value keeps coming up, right? Um, so this is the position as it stands, okay? So um, let me sort of conclude. I know I, I've gone on a bit and uh, I, I know there are many, many questions. So I want to go uh, uh, into some suggestions, some, some positive, constructive things. How can we make the judiciary more independent in Singapore? Well, uh, I think from what I've said so far, I think one thing we can do is to have a judicial appointment commission, an independent one. That would be very good, I think, because you would encourage a larger pool of persons who might be suitable to be members of the bench. Right? And, the, and more importantly, in terms of accountability, the public can actually see who are the available candidates. And then you can say, hey, how come they appointed that one and not this one? This guy looks good, right? I mean, there is some, there is some measure of public control uh, in terms of accountability. Secondly, let's get rid of the judicial commissioners. Let's get rid of the supernumerary judges. I think it, it is time. Right? And if you think that you know, judges are, much, are, 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 are certainly serviceable beyond the age of 65, no problem. Let's increase the retirement age to 70 or 75 with an optional retirement. Right? So, so you, you, you don't have to keep saying, oh, let me extend beyond a certain age. 
uh, and of course, repeal 95.9, which is the provision which talks about appointing uh, a single judicial commissioner for a single case. I think these, these are very simple things that can be done, right? Um, I wanted to say a little bit and, and end off with this. It's not enough that the courts are independent. The courts should also be accessible because you can have very independent courts. But if ordinary people don't have access to the courts or un are unable to get their just desserts in courts, you might as well not have courts, right? Independent or otherwise. So I think there are some impediments to uh, access to justice. Beyond costs, right? Costs can always be met one way or the other. The courts are very conscious that courts are uh, costs are high, but they can do something to keep it lower. Number one is we have rather stringent rules about what we call local standby, standing to uh, fight to to run cases. Okay, right now the law is in the state of flux. Uh, there are, for example, you see, uh, in terms of standing, right? Basically the rules of standing prevent busy bodies from going to court and litigating on a lark. In other words, I, 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 you know, it's none of my business, but I feel that my, my poor neighbour is suffering, so I'm going to go and sue on behalf of my neighbour. Right? Uh, you, you want to avoid those kinds of situations because otherwise the, the courts might be flooded with all kinds of strange uh, types of litigation. But where it comes to public interest, I think the rules can be relaxed a little bit. Right now, quite clearly, if your constitutional rights are being affected, you definitely have the right to go to court. Of course, if they arrest you and then they, didn't, they fail to charge you before a magistrate within 48 hours, of course you can go to court. You are personally affected. But what about things that the state is required to do but does not affect you personally and directly, right? What if you thought that the HDB upgrading policy was unconstitutional, but you don't live in an HDB flat? Can you not take this up? It is a constitutional matter. It is an equality matter. Can you take it up? Uh, I would suggest that for these kinds of public interests uh, and on constitutional issues, I think the rules on local standard can be more relaxed and you should allow for these kinds of cases to go to court. Right? Um, I think the second thing which is uh, bothering me quite a lot, which is that whenever cases go, you see there's costs involved. Uh, in bring, bringing cases to court. And I'm talk, not talking about paying your lawyers alone. Eh? When you lose a case, you can have costs awarded against you. If a cost is awarded against you, you basically pay not just your lawyer, but you pay a portion of the other lawyer's fees. Now, you can almost never get full recovery of costs. Okay, uh, The court ensures that you, you would get probably half to two-thirds of your actual costs. But that's still a burden. I mean, if this guy gets some big gun lawyer on the other side, or uh, then I end up having to pay a cost because I'm bringing up a case that is of major public significance. That should not be the case. And therefore, I would urge that the courts should seriously think about giving nominal costs for public interest cases. In other words, well, yes, you've lost the case. Well, I will award costs against you, but something nominal, $50, right, $100. Okay, not or what you full cost, and then you have to bear the other side's cost. It could be tens of thousands of dollars. That is an impediment for people bringing cases to court. What if you lose? Finally, I think um, rules for appeal for public interest cases uh, involving points of law can also be relaxed. This is one of the strange things about our judicial system, whereby if you want and you have no right of appeal and you want leave to appeal, you go back to the same judge who 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 basically lost you your case or held against you, and you say, oh, I think your judgment is wrong. Can I appeal against you? Uh, I mean, I think that, that that is very, very odd. Okay, I, I think... Uh, 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 and, and if you say, yes, uh, you, you know, fine, you may appeal. Uh, and some judges are actually quite uh, open about this. right? Nobody likes being wrong. Nobody likes being reversed. But some judges are actually say, oh, yeah, well, if you think I'm wrong, fine, go appeal. Some people are not so... Uh, open name. I say, no, you, I'm uh, denying you right of appeal and that's the end of the story. In the case, never goes up to a higher court. Okay, Let me end with something that is not in here, which is about this whole question of defamation. Okay, so criticism that government always wins defamation cases. Um, like I said, number one, 
if I have no chance of winning, if I'm advising any politician, I'd say, don't go to court. Okay? By the way, it's not as if the opposition has never uh, won any cases, but not in court. Uh, if you ask Mr. Cham Si Tong, he has actually gotten settlements from two PAP MPs, one of them a minister, for defamation. Why? Because the lawyers for those two PAP politicians told them, you definitely defame Cham, don't go to court. All right? So then you, you settle, right? And then, of course, somebody went and asked Cham and said, hey, how come you don't do like them? You know, go after them, just sue them in court. And then, of course, he scored a political point. He said, well, you know, unlike some people, I'm not very vindictive. Right? <laughs> uh, uh, so, so the point here is this. The law is the same. If our criticism is that the law in Singapore is somehow uh, 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 conjured in a way which is in favour of one party, the government, as opposed to others, then I think we are very wrong about this. The test is no doubt a conservative one, but if you don't know what, it's an English test. The test for defamation remains the same, has remained the same since the 1930s from an English House of Lords case called Sim and Stretch which is still good law in England, by the way. And the test is very simple. Do I uh, lower you in the estimation of right-thinking members of the public? If I lower your estimation in the right thinking, in the minds of the right-thinking members of the public, that is defamation. Okay? Now, uh, it's a very easy test to satisfy. Very easy test to satisfy, uh, which is why, believe it or not, the defamation capital of the world is London. Right? All these European royalties want to go after people, they're also in London. Because London is the most uh, amenable in terms of the law. This is still the law. We follow English law, so we are no different. So for people who criticise us and say that, well, it's easier to get sued in Singapore for better permission, wrong. That's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. Okay? Uh, it's the same test. Okay? The difference is in exceptions. Now, the U.S. has taken a very, very extreme position in a uh, uh, case called New York Times and Sullivan, very famous case. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court m held that in order for a public figure uh, to sue for defamation, uh, that person must prove actual malice. In other words, it must show that you had in mind to defame him, and you actually did it. Okay, so two components, the mental idea, the mental uh, culpability that I wanted to do it, and I actually did it. Now, sometimes you may defame somebody inadvertently. You may say something that you never thought of as defamatory, but ends up being defamatory. Uh, you could juxtapose two pictures, and then suddenly it becomes defamatory without knowing it. I, I remember one particular, back in the days when there was a new paper, new, newspaper called The New Nation, right? Um, this, 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 of course, no, no, nobody stood for defamation there. But um, there was a, uh, it's a small, it's a tabloid, right? It's a bit, bit like the new paper. And on one half of it, I remember, there was an article about how um, if you cycle too much, it can cause impotence, right? right? So it was like something like cycling causes impotence. Then next to it was a picture of a guy in a, on a bicycle in a cycle suit, clearly recognisable. This man was the president of the Singapore Cycling Federation. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> I don't need to explain more, right? Of course, these two things are not connected, but somehow the, the picture editor, I think he really uh, half asleep, right? He put it right next to it. And so the moment people look at it, oh, hey, this guy. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> this is inadvertent. Obviously, there was no, I mean, you know, I mean, it could happen to anyone. Uh, and you could defame somebody like this. He, he, he took it in good humor and he laughed and he said, well, yeah, yeah, obviously I haven't been cycling enough, right? Uh, <laughs> 
you know, but you, you understand, right, how things can happen. So it's not always just about politicians, and so it could be ordinary folk, and somehow uh, some kinds of defamation could be inadvertent. So in order for public figures, right, to sue uh, in America, uh, they have this public figure exception in New York Times and Sullivan that requires actual malice. The public policy reason was that, well, if you're a public figure, you, you first of all, accepted public office and you accept all the stuff that comes with it, right? In other words, uh, you, you accepted this risk. You know, you go on TV, sure people don't like your face, right? You know if you, you say something, somebody else will say you are wrong. I mean, why? You're a politician, of course. That, that is part and parcel of the game, right? This is one big policy reason. Second one, they said, well, public figures have access to media. They can always, they have many, many avenues to redress the defamation, whereas individuals don't. So therefore, we expect public figures to have thicker skin than other people. Okay. Singapore clearly rejected this. By the way, New York Times and Sullivan is good law only in America, and I think there are two Canadian cases, all right, and the European Court of Human Rights. Nowhere else. Australia doesn't accept this. Canada, except for one decision, doesn't accept this. So it's not universal. Huh? It's not universal. Our position has been, and, uh, and, and so when we look at defamation cases in Singapore, uh, you say, okay, let's look at what the law is. The law is sim and stretch. Uh, had, did they apply it correctly or not? I have studied every single defamation case that's been reported. Okay? In my mind, there is one case they got it wrong. Only one. This was Lee Kuan Yew against JB Jaratnam in relation to Tang Liang Hong, where they imputed innuendo. Right? This was the case where uh, at the end of a rally, JBJ stood up and he held uh, a piece of paper in his hands and he said, in my hands I have here the police report filed by Mr. Tang Liang Hong against Mr. Go Chok Tong and his people. And that was held both by the High Court and by the Court of Appeal to be defamatory. Now, I actually asked JBJ, I said, hey, you bluffing or what? You, you, were you really holding police report or you just took some pieces of paper? You know, sometimes lawyers, they will just... <laughs> he said, no, no, no. Those were really Liang Hong's reports. <laughs> oh, okay. So, it's a fact, right? Now, one uh, defense against... Uh, defamation is justification. If it's true, it is, then how can it be defamatory? So is, is it true that you were really holding the police reports? You say, yes, it's absolutely true. These were the police reports. They were handed to me, I looked at them, and then I showed it to the, the crowd at the rally. I did it. So then that, that then begs the question, well, how can that be defamatory? Right? And here, I think the court got it wrong. I think they lean too far in favour of the reputation of individuals, in particular of any politician, right? Uh, in saying that, well, you are imputing, right? So they said, well, if you look at any ordinary person hearing this, would immediately think that Mr. Go Chok Tong had done something really serious to merit him being reported to the police. I, I don't know, we don't have that many people here, but do you really think that way? I would have thought, well, you know, look, lots of people file police reports for all sorts of reasons. Any of you who have been national policemen, uh, uh, national service policemen before will know that these guys come to the police station and report all kinds of things. Cat died, la, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, people report all sorts of things. So that does not, in my mind, mean that, it, it, you know, but here it's a question of judgment. Uh, and, and truly, I've looked at all these judgments and I say, well, were, were there cases where there clearly was no defamation and they got uh, sued for defamation successfully? I think uh, they probably got it wrong in this one case. The rest of them, quite clearly, they were defamatory, right? Given the law as it stands. So I, I think I should stop here because I've gone on for a little bit too long and then uh, uh, welcome questions and comments. Thank you very much.